Asanteni sana kwa kuwa pamoja nasi kwenye uhusiano wa imani. Obrigado por sintonizar a Conexão da Fé. Gracias por sintonizarnos en la Conexión de Fé. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God. Hello, my name is Ralph Sepek. I'm a missionary to Guyana, South America, and I appreciate the privilege and opportunity to be able to preach God's Word to you today. Let's look at the book of uh, Acts, chapter 6. We're going to speak today on, I want to speak today on Paul's conversion. Apostle Paul was a man mightily used by God. But there's a dark path to Apostle Paul that probably you don't know about until you find out in the Word of God. The Apostle Paul wrote most of the books of the New Testament. But we're going to see the dark side of the Apostle Paul before he got saved. Before, as we do, let's look at Acts chapter 6, verse number 8, and we'll start there. The Bible says in verse number 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now, you would have expected Stephen to be a, a pastor or an evangelist or preacher. The Bible says he, Stephen was a deacon. That, that, that's a mighty office that God had given him. But look at Stephen's, what the Bible says about Stephen. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain other synagogue, which is called the Synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and them of Cilicia and of Asia disputing with Stephen. He was preaching them the word of God. These were Jewish leaders hearing Stephen preached the word of God, but not in the way they wanted to hear. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. They considered Stephen an unlearned man. But when he was able to confound them, what does the Bible say took place? Verse 11 says, And they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses, against God. You know, they brought men to lie in, to lie about Stephen, because they couldn't find no, anything wrong with what he was saying. Verse 11 says, They suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes that came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. You see, they didn't want anyone preaching about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, they said he, he died and his disciples, um, his disciples had taken his body and stole his body and disposed of his body. Jesus had never raised from the dead is what they were taught. This is what they were believing. And here's, Jesus, here's Stephen out there in the center of the center of the town preaching the gospel, preaching about Jesus Christ. They caught him, they brought him, brought him to council, verse 12 says. And set up false witnesses and said, This man seeketh the thought to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. He didn't speak anything against the holy place and the law. He preached to them Jesus Christ. For we have heard him say that this is Jesus of Nazareth, that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the custom which Moses has delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him and saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. I'd say Brother Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit and the power of God. And um, in Acts 51, we're going to turn there in just a moment. We're going to talk more about this Stephen. But in Acts, 51, um, Acts 7, verse 51, we're going to see what, what Stephen was preaching to them. He says here, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers do, so do ye. He was, he was preaching hard, stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hearts and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. As we see here, Stephen says they were resisting the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was at work in those lives of those men that were hearing the word of God. And the Bible says they were resisted them as well as their forefathers resisted also and killed the prophets. Verse 51, go to verse 52. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of them the coming of the just one of whom ye have now have been now betrayers and murderers. Now, 
He's bringing back that their forefathers killed the prophets. Now they have slain the just one. They have slain Jesus Christ, the Holy One of God, of whom you have been now betrayers and murderers. That's some pretty rough preaching. Who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. They were given the truth but did not keep the law. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. This young man was Saul. We'll later know him as the Apostle Paul. They laid, they stoned Stephen. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord Lay not this into their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I want us to behold, think about this righteous young man that, that preached the word of God. He preached the truth to them. He showed them that even their forefathers killed the prophets. They also, the Jews, killed Jesus Christ. And then this man, the son of God. And they got so under conviction. The Bible tells us the Holy Spirit. They resisted the Holy Spirit. And they came and they took Stephen and they cried with a loud voice. And he, I want you to hear what he had to say. Lay not this sin to their charge. Even those men that were killing him, he had no grief, no pain, no bitterness against them. Because he knew they were lost and on their way to hell. And, G, and, and Stephen says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Don't you remember when Jesus died on the cross and he said, Father... Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Acts chapter 8, verse 1 tells us. I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 8, verse 1. I'm not going to go. It's on the board right now. We're going to look at Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And there, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the Bible tells us that Saul was consenting unto his death. Who was this young man Saul? Well, he was a Pharisee. He was a leader of the Jews. He saw how the high priests acted towards Stephen. And they had laid, their, laid Stephen clothes at his feet. The Bible says he was consenting unto his death. Now let's look to the next, next frame in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. The Bible says that, and Saul, Acts 9 verse 1 says, And Saul, yet breathing out, again, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were young men, whether they were men or women, he might bring them to bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined right about him a light from heaven. Now I'm going to stop right there for just a moment. Here's Apostle Paul. His name is Saul. He's not the Apostle Paul yet. His name is Saul. And there he sees Stephen persecuted, stoned. They gnashed upon him with their teeth. They rejected the words that he was preaching. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul or Saul sees them and how they treat Stephen at this time, breathing and everything that they did. I'm not sure how Paul, how he got that burden, how he felt like it was this his job to continue the persecution. The Bible doesn't say how that happened. But the Bible does tell us something pretty powerful about Paul's attitude. And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest. He went to the high priest and got permission 
and desired him letters to Damascus and synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they be, were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. His desire was to stomp out the name of Jesus Christ. His desire probably was to kill more Christians. He saw the reaction of the Pharisees and the priests and how they killed Stephen. And it was his desire, I believe, he, he even believed he was called of God to go and do these things. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus and suddenly there shined right about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Wow, I'm sure that surprised Paul. I'm sure that shook him up a little bit. Let's find out. And he said, who art thou, Lord? Well, he knew he was Lord because he knew there had to be something about what was going on. And if he could speak to him the way he did, he knew he had to be Lord. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I want us to think about something. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Well, Jesus was already in the grave. had already been risen again from the dead and went up into heaven. But as the persecution he brought against the church, God's people, God's believers, Jesus said he was persecuting Je Paul or the apostle or Saul was persecuting Jesus by persecuting the church. Jesus took it personally, didn't he? He said, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I want us to think about this. Back in those days when farmers had oxen, they would have a, a long stick with a pointed edge. And sometimes there were some stubborn hard-headed bulls that didn't want, or oxen that didn't want to plow, didn't want to move, and they would have to get these ox goads or these pricks and prick them against in their legs to get them moving. And they would say that those oxen would lift up their legs and try to kick back against them pricks, and every time they did, they would get that thing pricked in the back of their legs. Let's think about this now. What is he talking about being kicked against the pricks? I believe what the Bible teaches about this, that Paul came under conviction of the Holy Spirit. Same heavy conviction of the Holy Spirit. And God was dealing with his life. Just as he heard Stephen preaching there before they stoned him, he said, ye also resist the Holy Spirit as did your fathers. And I believe also as he was preaching right there that Paul heard the preaching, heard the word of God. He was also resisting the Holy Spirit. And then as he watched Stephen as he was dying, the Bible says he had the, he, his face was as the face of an angel. He had no grief and no anger towards those people. But he looked at their face and steadfastly behind the face of an angel. And as they went on to stone him to death, he cried out, Lord, lay not this into their charge. A man who was full of love for those people, full of grace and truth, the word of God, full of the Holy Spirit, and they killed him. And then there were other believers. Remember the Bible tells us that over 500 people saw Jesus and raised again from the dead? I'm sure many of those believers went out and preached the gospel, preached and told others about Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that Paul was yet breathing out threatenings, persecuting the church. Many were being persecuted. Many people were being killed at this time. But as he, I'm sure saw, as he watched and saw these events taking place, he's seen the hearts of those people. He's seen the lives of those people. These people weren't in anger. They weren't fighting them. They weren't resisting them. They were on, they, they had love in their hearts for the people they were preaching to, yet they were being persecuted. And I'm sure much of that, most of what he's seen, most of what he heard, got a hold of his heart. And the Holy Spirit started bringing conviction to Saul's heart. The Bible tells us in John's 644, no man can come to me except the Father which has set me draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. 
The Word of God tells us that no man can come to the Father except the Holy Spirit of God draws him. And I believe through what we read here with the Word of God and through what we see in other parts of the Word of God that the Holy Spirit is drawing Saul to himself through conviction of his sin. And I believe also I've seen people under heavy conviction. The more under conviction they got, the meaner, the harder they get. They become cruel and angry. That sounds like the Apostle Paul, does it, before he got saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, the Bible tells us, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but sorrow of the world worketh death. First, I want to talk about godly sorrow. It's a sorrow that God brings on a person who's not saved, and he's dealing with them. He's convicting them in their heart. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. And I believe that godly sorrow was taking place in Saul's heart where he was resisting the Word of God. He was resisting the Holy Spirit. And the more you resist, the more there's a striving in your life, the more sorrowful you get. I wonder right now, as anyone is listening, could that be happening to you even right now? That there's a sorrow in your heart. There could be a conviction in your heart. And God is working godly sorrow in your heart. Are you resisting the, are you resisting the Holy Spirit also at the same time? Godly sorrow worketh repentance. I'm going to go back to verse 5. The Bible says again, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. You know, I love how Jesus Christ works and how he speaks. The Lord Jesus Christ knew exactly what was in Saul's heart at that point. <laughs> I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Here Saul's trying to stamp out the name of Jesus Christ and here his people, his godly people who have been believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth, preaching the word of God, showing the love of God in their hearts. And they're trying to stomp out the name of Jesus Christ. It would be understandable if these people fought back, if they were thieves and murderers. It would be understandable for him to want to kill them and stop this. But that's not what these people were doing. These people were preaching the name of Jesus Christ. Many of them saw Jesus raised from the dead. And how could they, how could they not continue to live for Jesus Christ after seeing him raised from the dead and give them the peace and joy in their hearts? He, just, he said, Saul, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. What an amazing testimony of the work of God in their lives. Just remember the last few words of, the, the, of Stephen, the, the deacon. Acts 7, 55 says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And later we see him saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Let's continue on. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, trembling and astonished, completely frightened, amazed at what has taken place in his heart. Not knowing exactly what is going on, but we hear something out of Saul's heart that was different. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said, Arise. The Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men in which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. I'm going to go back to that for just a second. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what would they have me to do? At this point, I believe Saul became a believer. It's hard to really tell on the words, but we see a different Saul. We probably, earlier we see him kicking against the pricks. Earlier we see him trembling out or uh, crying out threatenings. Then he recognized who it was that came to him. He said, Lord. Nobody can call Jesus Lord except through the Holy Spirit. And he said, and, the, and, the, and Lord, what will thou have me to do? Lord, I'm yours now. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? I have no idea what to do now, Lord. I'm, 
The Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Paul was a saved man. He had a changed life in that instant. We, talked, we can talk about the miracle, the, the miracle of the gospel, the power of the gospel. That's the power of the gospel that changes the life. One that hates God and is angry at God to one who trusts in God and is willing to do whatever God has for him to do. And the man was journeying with him, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. I want to think about Saul's conversion. I want to think about all the things we just talked about right now. Paul later went into Damascus. A man named Ananias came and prayed for, prayed for Saul. Yes, that man Ananias was told by God to go see, to see Saul and pray for him. And can you imagine what Ananias was thinking right now? He, he, had never, he didn't know that, Paul, that Saul had gotten saved. But God told Ananias to go and pray for Saul. He will show him what things he must suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Ananias listened to God, went to pray for Paul. Paul was blinded at that point, and the scale fell off, his eyes, off Paul's eyes. Ananias introduced him to the other disciples, and Paul went out preaching. And the apostle Paul had a changed life. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, the same one we just got saved, the Bible says here in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, For wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now, I just quoted that verse just a moment ago, but this is the Apostle Paul now writing the exact same thing I just said, and I'm, I'm sure it brings him back to the same day that he got saved, where, where he was trembling and astonished. He says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? The same man writes this verse here, and he, Wherefore I give unto you understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and no, no, that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. There had been a work done in the Apostle Paul's heart. The Apostle Paul also wrote these three verses here I'm going to read. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The same apostle Paul that, that had laid there astonished and trembling said, Lord, what thou have me to do was a bold preacher of the gospel. He preached, he said this in the book of Ephesians, as you just read. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul could testify his works couldn't save him. In fact, they condemned him even more. But through faith in Jesus Christ, Paul got saved and was a changed man. I don't think that God's going to come down in a, in a great light for you and show you all these things. Why, why I don't believe it? Because I believe those, those type of miracles have ceased. But I do believe when you read the Word of God, you're going to be touched by the same Holy Spirit. You're going to be spoken to by the same Holy Spirit or Jesus Christ as the Word of God did for the Apostle Paul. In verse 10 of that same chapter, it says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath ordained that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. We are created. We are new creatures in Christ. We are a new created vessel that God wants to use for his honor and glory. Just like the apostle Paul, I know you won't be writing scripture because the scripture is closed and that's it. But you can preach the word of God as the apostle Paul did. You can tell others by Jesus as the apostle Paul did. You are just as much a workman you are just so much a new creation as the Paul, Paul, also Paul was too when you get saved. The Bible tells us, I'm going to remove, uh, move over to uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to go ahead and read these verses to you today. And guess who wrote this? Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through, 1 through 7 that we're going to read? The same Apostle Paul. 
Romans 6, 1 says, what should we say then? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, we're, we, we can bank what Apostle Paul is saying by his own testimony. You see, many people talk about the grace of God. You know, the grace of God forgave us and saves us. For grace of God changes our lives. The grace of God, you know, brought us to Jesus. The grace of God saved us. Now we live by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. We also live them by grace. And so the Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? He knows that grace is going to abound in our lives. He says in verse 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Wow, I like, I like what he just said there. How shall we that are dead to sin? He says when a person has trusted Christ as a Savior, we are dead to sin. Remember it said, sin has no more dominion over me once we're saved. We reign in life by Jesus Christ. We're dead to sin. We don't have to sin anymore. The only time we we're going to sin now is because we have submitted the temptations of the sin. We don't have to sin. We're not under the power. We're not bound by sin anymore. Verse 3 says, know, know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Now Apostle Paul, now by his own testimony, says we are supposed to walk in newness of life after we get saved. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. We are to walk in newness of life. God wants to change your life. God wants to give you a new life. And he wants you to walk in that new life. As Jesus was, was buried and raised again from the dead, and that Holy Spirit resurrection that raised him up from the dead, we also have a spiritual resurrection in our life. Not a physical resurrection on this earth. We're going to have one one day on this earth after, when Jesus comes back. But our spiritual life has a resurrection. We have a new life. We can continue to live for God. And that's what God's intent is in our life. For if we've been planned together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. As Apostle Paul had a new life, we are given a new life. Verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We have a new life in Jesus Christ. We have a new we still have the same body, but that, that body of sin is destroyed by the spiritual life which is in Jesus Christ. We don't have to submit to the, the, to the wiles of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. We can submit to the Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Verse 7 also says, For he that is dead is free from sin. You ever see a dead person sin? That's the exact same truth that Paul is trying to get us to understand once we get saved. We are dead to sin. We don't have to sin anymore. I want to encourage you today. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God.